All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good to see everyone here. If you had a good week, uh, it's uh, hard. To, this week went pretty fast for me. I don't know. It was, I mean, it was slow but fast. You know, I can't believe it's been a whole week, and but also kind of slow because uh, the boys were sick all week. So that was not uh, super pleasant. Remember, I told you last Sunday, kind of. Uh, Birdie started off with uh, not feeling good, and then it just kind of went down the line, and then Trina got it, so it's one of those weeks, but no big deal, just, uh, it's just one of those blurred weeks, like this is just, oh, I'm sure you've been, many of you have been there before, uh, but nothing else too new and exciting per se, you know, I uh, took the car to the garage, I mentioned I was having some car trouble getting my car started, and uh, you know, and there's still no luck with that, I, I don't know really what the problem is, so we'll try to get that uh, straightened out. I don't know, but anyone knows why a car won't start, yet the battery is good, the alternator is good, nothing seems to be drawing power. If you know, see me afterwards, because I have no idea. I'll try to figure it out. Bobby, work on that for me, because I have no idea what's, what the deal with it is. Um, but anyways, so hopefully you had a good week. We are pressing forward here and uh, moving along. Like Pam said, it's, you know, before you know it's going to be February, and uh, you know, I'm a, kind of a big fan of uh, Groundhog, the Groundhog Day movie, right, with Bill Murray. And some people hate it, some people love it, but it's kind of a classic. I've always said it's one of, one of my goals is to go up there and stay at that bed and breakfast in Punxsutawney where they kind of uh, filmed the exterior of the movie. I guess they didn't actually film a lot of the movie in the place, but uh, more of the exteriors. But anyway, that's very, very random, but that's what came to mind when Pam mentioned about February. And, and upcoming months. So anyhow, so we are moving forward and today's message is actually on Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, building a life of faith. And we're going to look at some of the things that are going on here. So let's kind of just begin and jump into it by reading Nehemiah. We'll read verses 1 through 4. It says this. <clears throat> in, <clears throat> in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who've survived the exile are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. <clears throat> so, this kind of scene opens up with uh, some dire circumstances in Jerusalem. So here uh, Nehemiah is. He's far away from Jerusalem. He's actually the cupbearer to the, the, the king of Persia. Uh, and as a cupbearer, his job was to you know, taste the drink and, and whatnot to make sure it wasn't poisoned. So he was willing to die for the king. That was his job. So he's far away. He hears about the situation that's going on with all the walls being burned and crumbled and down. And he is greatly distressed uh, of what's going on. Uh, and what we're going to learn today here is, even though Nehemiah wasn't a prophet per se, or a spiritual leader, or anything like that, we're going to see that his choices and his decisions and his actions actually resulted in change, actually had a big impact. And so hopefully as we look this, uh, this morning at some of these uh, principles that he applies to his life, we can see, okay, um, how can I build a life of faith in my life, right? Because the reality is everyone's building something. Uh, what are you building in your life? Uh, what kind of things are you building up and, and moving towards in your life? Everyone's building something and everyone's building for something. And so what is that? Nehemiah gives some great uh, principles on what it looks like to build a life of faith, especially in challenging times, because you see his reaction, right? He's, he's greatly distressed. He's weeping when he finds out what actually is happening in Jerusalem. Um, but he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just continue weeping and weeping and do, doesn't do anything about it. He actually has some things that he does to incorporate. So what can we learn um, what are some principles we can learn from Nehemiah? Number one principle we see is understand the importance of hearing and responding to God's call, right? As Christians, we have to realize, you know, are we even listening for God's call of what he might want you to do in your life? Um, the reality is if you're a Christian, if you have the Holy Spirit, God speaks to you um, often in, in whispers and gentle nudges to the Holy Spirit, right? It's not, all, it's not necessarily always big, loud, booming voices and thunder from heaven. But if you listen to your spirit, what is God leading you and directing you to do uh, or, or, or anything like that? Um, Nehemiah here realized it was, the, it was so crucial to not only hear, but then respond to, to God's call. Um, you know, think about it. When he heard about the, the walls being destroyed, 
his initial reaction was obviously weeping in great distress, very sad to hear about what had happened um, to this thing. Because the reality is this remnant of, of Israelites that had returned about 70 years or so, um, they started to rebuild the temple, but they didn't ever finish it. They never finished the walls or anything like that, and it's kind of laid uh, left, um, left in ruins. And uh, we'll see a little bit more about what's going on in here. But think about this. Actually, for Nehemiah, hearing bad news actually was the start of his call to do something great for God, right? It was in that moment of distress, in that moment of bad news, where actually a call happened and then a response happened. You know, we often think that only when things are going smooth, well, and good, that we can actually have um, a positive impact, right? But there's a great example. In a great moment of bad news and distress, this brought about a call and a response that had a big, big change for, for God's people, right? And so I just say this is, uh, this morning, consider what is God calling you to do? Uh, how is God calling you to make a difference for his kingdom, for this church, uh, for your family, for you know, your workplace, for anyone that encounters, right? Uh, have, you, have you thought about this? Like, what, have you, uh, what is God calling me to do? Um, is he calling me to serve somehow? Is he calling me to, to do a certain ministry? Is he calling me to um, bless someone? Is he calling me to just encourage someone? Is he calling? And the reality is yes to all those things, but how, where? Uh, and those are the things we have to kind of keep our ears up to, right? Uh, because so many, we've talked about this many times, many Christians become so complacent, right? They just, oh, Christianity or salvation, I did that, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago when I was baptized, and then they've never made any more, you know, movement towards uh, walking with Christ in their relationship. And so, again, um, this is not just a... Um, Christianity isn't just like a flu shot, right? Oh, I did that, you know. This is a living, ongoing relationship with the living God your entire life until we are brought into perfection when that great day comes. Uh, and so I just ask us this morning is, what is God calling you to do? You know, think about this. If, what, what if God would write like a, a, a new New Testament, you know, and, and we were in the book? How would he say First Baptist Church of Ford City responded to his call? How would he, how would he reply that you, his people, um, faithfully re- responded to the call of what he is calling this church to do here and now, right? Because um, this is a history of what God has done and is going to do, but he has not stopped working, right? He's still... Uh, wants to and is working through his people, the church being his people. And so the question is, how are you responding to the call God has given you? And everyone here has a maybe unique, different calling, but you got to have your ears open. And the question is, how do you respond to that? Nehemiah had his ears open, and he responded in a way that we're going to see was pretty, pretty powerful. Um, second principle we need to see as well is pray about everything. You know, pray about everything. Sometimes as Christians, we neglect the importance of prayer or the power of prayer. Um, look, go to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Uh, that's Nehemiah chapter 4. Uh, so basically what happens is Nehemiah is going to go to the king of Persia, going to request some time um, to, to uh, go to Jerusalem, help rebuild the wall. Uh, because the king sees he's distressed, ask him what's wrong. And before, before Nehemiah even replies, though, this is the principle we need to see, before Nehemiah even replies, he prays. You know, that's, that's pretty, that should show us just um, the heart of Nehemiah, right? That even before he replied, he just said a prayer. Like, God, give me the words to say. What do I say? What do you mean to say? You know, what do you mean to do? Uh, and so this is an important thing, you know. When was the last time? that we all do this, right? That, that we re- pray before we maybe do something that we think God is calling us to do or pray before giving an answer that maybe we're not sure how to answer. Uh, now again, you don't have to go over the board with this. We're like, God, do you want me to have broccoli or, or peas for dinner? You know what I mean? You don't have to go that far. Um, but this, this is a good principle to think about that. You know what? Um, we should be consulting God more. God, what do you want me to do? God, how should I reply to this? Um, and this is like in the moment, right? He didn't have to like go off to his room or anything like that. Like if someone, if, if you're in a situation and, and you're not sure how to respond or what to do, boom, right there, say a quick microwave prayer. God, give me the word to say. God, what do I do? Listen and, and see what happens, right? 
this is something that Nehemiah really, really shows us. It, it shows us that, um, and then also too, um, when he prayed, uh, he's a very interesting principle you even see in Nehemiah's prayer, right? What does he do? And so, so some things that he does in his prayer, he, he glorifies God's attributes, right? He's praising God in his prayer. It's not just simply, it's not always um, just asking for things, too. There's different things you can incorporate into, into a prayer. So he's praising God for his attributes. He's asking forgiveness of um, the sins of his people. You know, he, he, all these different things that he's kind of laying out there. He's asking God to uh, restore his people in different parts of his prayer. He's praying for success of his endeavor. Like all these different components are kind of mixed in that you can see that Nehemiah does in his prayer. Um, but, but nevertheless, you're going to see that um, his prayer life reflects his obedience to God. His prayer life reflects his heart. Uh, and so as Christians, we just need to make sure that we're doing a better job of praying, God, what do you want me to do? God, how do I respond? How do I reply? Sometimes we're so busy trying to rely on our own stuff that we forget, you know what? There's someone much more powerful at our, at our disposal, if you will, you know, who, who is ready to uh, guide us and lead us and, and uh, help us. Uh, so just make sure that you don't try to do everything on your own power, right? Just say, God, empower me. Show me. Um, this is a great key that we see here, right? Um, and so I just say that we can open our hearts to prayer. And um, when you do that, you see the blessing that comes from that. A uh, third thing that we see Nehemiah applied here is exhibiting patience and hope. You know, uh, so here he is, this dire situation, greatly distressed, uh, going to go before the king of Persia and, and see about how he can go and help um, lead this thing. Because remember, Nehemiah, no great spiritual leader or, or anything like that per se, in, in, in the position he is. Uh, then what's going to happen is, in his position as this cupbearer to the king of Persia, he's going to end up essentially the governor of Jerusalem, really, uh, or, or re um, uh, revitalizing and leading this movement of rebuilding this wall that has been laying in ruins. Uh, and so, but part of the thing we need to see with Nehemiah is he exhibited patience and hope. Um, and so think about this, because actually if you think about uh, even in, in part of this thing here, um, part of the, the whole part of the, the narrative leading up to it, he actually prays for four months waiting for God to reply. You know, sometimes we think right away you're going to get a reply just that second. Here, he actually replies like, or, or, or waits like four months until he hears a response or reply. Uh, and so sometimes we have to realize, you know what, God's timing is different than ours. You know, sometimes God's answer is wait. Sometimes God's answer is not yet. Uh, sometimes the answer is no. Uh, but we have to realize that it's not always how we want it, when we want it, you know? Like the old saying, I want it and I want it now, or, or Burger King, I want it my way. You know, I enjoy a good Whopper, but uh, sometimes that's not how it works out, per se, right? We have to have patience. So go to um, chapter 2, verse 11, says this. He says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. He took his time once he arrived in Jerusalem um, that we see that, right? Uh, and, and, and we're going to see that he actually uh, doesn't tell people right away. He, he, he spends some time. He, he kind of sets himself apart. He... he it, um, assesses the situation. Uh, he prayed for four months and now he's going to go there. And, and so this is a thing where it's like, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to exhibit some patience. I'm going to go about things the, the smart way to uh, evaluate what actually is going on. So as he goes there, he, he does not tell him people, right? He, he um, uh, is going to do some reconnaissance, if you will, to see what's going on there exactly. Uh, and then he didn't tell anyone what God had put in his heart as well, right? So again, there's a theme. Um, God put this in his heart, right? So ask yourself, did God, has God put something in your heart to do for him? Uh, a, a, a need that you would like to see met? A, 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 a position or ministry that you would like to see started? Is that on your heart? Did God put that in your heart? Uh, and maybe you're just waiting for someone else to do it. Maybe it's, you're the one that's called to do that. Um, because uh, again, Nehemiah didn't have this thing put in his heart and he's like, okay, someone else can go do it. God put it on his heart and therefore then he goes forth and does it. Uh, he, he's praying about it. He has a patience. He has a, he has a, a, um, a hope in there here as well. And that's a key thing that we see here, right? Um, uh, he, he, he never 
went out and just went to attack his enemies either, right? He could have went and tried to attack the enemies that were surrounding Jerusalem. He didn't do that. He, he was going to rely on God to do what God was going to do. Um, and so I get this hard now because we live in a time that's very fast-paced, instant gratification, right? Instant delivery, Amazon Prime, uh, and we don't like to wait, and we don't like to have patience. Uh, but that's a very key thing that we have as Christians is, you know what? Uh, make sure that we are taking our time um, to, to have patience on God's prayer, to have patience on what maybe God is wanting to do or, or going to do. Uh, be smart in how he, he went about his plan uh, to do what God has put on his heart. And that's a key thing for sure. Um, he also expressed hope in, in when we think about this. Now, again, the situation is dire. He, he was weeping when he first heard this. It, it looked like it was a bad situation. Uh, but he also expressed hope that God was going to fulfill what he always promised to do, right? That God was going to restore Israel. God was going to bring his people back to himself because the people had fallen away. The people have, had turned from him. Uh, and so Nehemiah, even in a bad situation, never gave up hope that God was going to fulfill his end of the deal, right? That God was going to do that. I don't know if I have this verse up there or not. I'm not sure, but do I have verse 8 and 18 up there? Is that up there? Yeah? Okay, let's read that. It says, And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. I also told them about my gracious hand um, of my God on me and what the king had said to me. Uh, and so in this situation, I want us to see it. Even when he was before the king, and even when he was before the people, he was always showing that God's hand was on him, right? He always recognized that this was God's movement. This was what God was doing. God's hand was on the situation. God's hand um, put that in Nehemiah's heart to accomplish his purpose. God's hand then actually was on the situation and allowed the king to grant his request. Uh, God's hand was on the situation to get all this thing organized to allow this project to be moved forward with, right? And so this was Nehemiah's position, that, that God did not give up on his people. That He's basically looking back and telling people, look, Look at this. You think this is all coincidence? You think this is all by accident? No, no. This timing, these situations, the people and places in position right here and now, God's hands on the movement. God is not finished with this yet, right? And so uh, he had patience, but he also exhibited hope on what God was um, doing in that situation, right? And so we bring hope when we, when we tell people how God has worked in our lives, you know? Uh, and that's the thing we can apply in our own lives as well. Just think about... You know, all the things um, that has kind of lined up to accomplish a purpose. It's just amazing to, to, to think about, you know. When was the last time you had thought about uh, or even noticed uh, God's hand in your life or a situation where you look back and say, oh, that was definitely God moving and God doing something, you know. And many times maybe you don't recognize it in the moment, but then you can look back and say, wow, I can see how God used that. I mean, even my, my own journey to being a, a pastor, like, I look back and I'm like, Phew. first of all, I never planned on being a pastor. Anyone ever knows me? That, I, that was not my life goal to set out being a pastor. Uh, and then I see the situations that kind of like lined up. And then just all the things of like the timing of someone telling me about this school, the timing of a, the scholarships, the timing of even like someone speaking a word of faith to me to turn my life back to God even well before that, the timing of all these things is kept, you know, even the timing of me being here, the way I graduated and the way I was brought in and then like all these things, you know, and in the moment, like I, and I'm not thinking like any of this about that. Like I'll, I'll even tell you like my, my very first day of seminary out in Ohio, out in Ashland, Ohio, it's about three hours away or so. Very first day, I'm, I'm all moved into the house and I'm in there and I'm just like, I remember just like crying like, God, I, what am I doing here? I don't even know. Like, I was literally crying, just like, okay, I'm here, but I don't know. And so maybe you feel that way sometimes. All you can do is just do one step in front. You know, you're not, you're not sure where you're going. Just take the very next step that you can see where to go, right? You're not sure where you're going to end up or go, or go. Just take the very next step that you can see in faith, right? And you've got to trust that God is doing something. And uh, there's different seasons too, right? There's different seasons in your life. Uh, maybe you're called to do this for a season, but it doesn't mean it's going to be forever. You know? Maybe God calls you to do something else in the next season. Uh, and, and so that's something you have to be open to and realize. But all I say is this is just um, have patience, trust in God, and, 
have, see that his hand is on a situation. Right? Even when things look challenging or whatever, uh, trust that God is going to fulfill his promise, right? God is going to continue to guide and lead and, and, and move you where he needs to move. And maybe it's uncomfortable, maybe you're unsure, and maybe you're not sure how God could possibly use this. Uh, but I, I would just say, if you trust God and continue just to move forward, uh, that's a powerful thing, you know? That, that really is an important thing. Um, actually, just, just comes to mind now, I remember seeing a big news article, and I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about the movie, I don't know anything about the actor, per se, but he did this big emotional speech. It's Brendan Fraser or whatever, you know, a big emotional speech because of a worst movie he did. Don't know anything about it, I'm not plugging it, but I just know the one phrase that really stuck out is that he was crying giving his speech. He's like, I just want you to know that um, basically good things will happen if you just if you find the strength to get up and move towards the light. You know what I mean? Just find the strength to get up and move towards the light. Press forward. Uh, and I think that's a very good theme, right? Again, I'm not going to read too much into him or his movie or anything like that, but you see God's people doing that, right? They, they, they even in despair, um, they get up and they move towards the light, they move towards God, they move toward what God is calling them, just don't stay down. It might be hard, it will be hard, it can be challenging, but trust in God. So again, he had patience, and he expressed hope, a theme that we see. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, number four, real quick. Uh, be prepared. You know, that's a key thing, too, that we don't want to underestimate. Be prepared uh, for might be what God is calling you to do. Now, sometimes maybe you can't always because it's something totally different, but I think that there are some things you can be prepared for. So go to um, uh, verse 4. It says, this is Nehemiah talking to the king before he goes. He says, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are, are buried so that I can rebuild it. Uh, then the king, uh, with the queen sitting beside him, he asked, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set him a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, might I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until my arrival in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make the beams for the gates and the citadel by the temples and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and a cavalry with me. So a few things here is he's and then we're going back and he's talking to the king about his um, desire to go and do this project. Number one is he starts off with a clear goal, right? He has a clear goal of what he wants to do and accomplish. That's very key, right? Um, because if, uh, if you don't have a goal, then what are you trying to accomplish or do? And very much in your life, okay, what is the goal in your life? Do you have any specific goals? If not, I would say get some goals, you know? Uh, uh, why not have any goals? Um, and again, there can be various things. We talked about in previous, previous months on, on different areas of our lives and topics and whatever it may be. But if you don't have a goal or a destination, how are you going to get there? You know, so many people are just floating around, no goals, not, no, not aiming towards anything to accomplish, not just kind of just eh, going through the motions, existing, Get some, get some big goals. And, and again, it can, you can start off with small goals. They don't have to be some big grand goals that oh, I'm going to be, you know, president or whatever it might be. I mean, you can have that goal if that's something you want to be doing. Um, but, but it can just be like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of bed, uh, you know, at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. Or, uh, instead of noon, if, if you're struggling with that. Uh, I'm going to, you know, walk, you know, maybe a mile today or half a mile, whatever it might be, you know, but, or spiritual goals, you know, I'm going to do this for God's kingdom, I'm going to, whatever it might be, but, so he had a clear goal, that's a key thing, and then when the king asked how he could help, what did he do? He laid out some different plans, right, he, 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 he was very smart in how he was talking, he was very um, courteous talking to the king of Persia with his request, so he was very respectful, um, but then he got all these letters so he could get to where he needed to go and make his journey easier, right? He needed timber, he needed all these different things. Um, and so this is a very smart guy who had a, a plan laid out. So you, so you get a goal, and then you, get, then you take some steps to make your, your plan easier, right? You lay out, I gotta I got, I got do this, then, then I gotta do this, and then I need to do this. And, and so he was smart in doing that. So be prepared, you know, if, if you're... 
um, having something in mind, you know, get a goal and then make some steps and be prepared to accomplish that. Many people don't do that. You know, many people say they have goals, but they're more dreams or wishes or fantasies than actual goals, right? Because there's no clear definition, there's no clear timeline, there's no actual steps or plans on how to get there. Uh, and so again, if you're going to go on a trip somewhere, uh, you know, you used to be able to know where am I going to go, and then here's the destination. You used to back in the day have a map where you could draw out your route or whatever, how to get there. Right now you just GPS it, but it doesn't work for you. But anyways, I, I just say, you know, do that. Uh, and then again, once he got to the city, he didn't announce his arrival, right? He was very smart in, okay, I'm going to check things out. I'm going to do some planning. I'm going to look at some things here, um, in, inspecting the, the, the damage secretly at night. Uh, and so he's just, he's smart. He's being prepared. Uh, he had a vision and a goal. He got steps to get letters and timber and all that in place to make things more smooth. Uh, and then he, he went and did the, the inspection. And just think about this. Um, ne Nehemiah's his plan it included forethought. It included um, the, 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 the teamwork, the persistence, the cooperation, plus trust in God, right? All those components were, were in his plan. And so I just say this is, you know, we should all be mindful uh, and, and do some, any kind of preparation, you know, careful plans to listen for God's guidance you know, in prayer and then do some planning, right? Like, I remember a, a professor um, at seminary always said, had a saying, he said, if, 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 if God deserves our best, which I think we can all agree he does, then our best should include some kind of form of intention, right? You know, being intentional for whether your prayer life or um, whatever God's calling you to do, um, or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, serving here somewhere or worshiping, whatever it might be, uh, that, you know what, to have some intent behind it, have some planning. Don't just try to wing it all, you know, willy-nilly, if you will. Uh, there's a way to actually have some intent um, for, for bringing your best to God and also to help better position yourself to do things more, more smoothly, right? I think that's key. Because, um, again, how he handled it was very smart. Uh, and he, even the way he talked to the king was very smart. Just, you know, he was very respectful. And, and um, uh, I, I, I just leave it at that because there's some ways to, to go about it. Number five, real quickly, uh, great leadership uh, or great leadership he, he, that inspired others he, he exhibited here. Um, he, when Nehemiah spoke, right, he it would inspire the people. He, he would encourage them. He, he, he shared the favor that the king gave him, right? He, he shared that God's hand was upon him. He motivated people, and they responded by going to work immediately, right? That's one thing he did. And so it's a simple principle, but are you encouraging other? Are you inspiring to other? Or are you just like, you know, negative Nelly, right? Oh, or whining, complaining, grumbling, um, whatever it might be. That's not a good way of doing things, you know. Uh, you got to have this energy, this way of encouraging, this way of, uh, of motivating, this way of, uh, of also uh, Nehemiah displayed servant leadership, right, of, of serving and walking and, and willing to help and, and willing to, to um, um, help get this goal accomplished, rather say. And so I just say this is a key thing here, right? He's, he's wanting to make sure people see, you know, God, God is with you. Look at the favor as God's hand's been upon me. Look at what he's doing, right? Uh, and so let's move forward and see what God is going to do through us, right? He, he broke the fa um, families up into teams that would do work on the wall in different sections here. Uh, he even uh, prayerfully prayed when they met opposition, all of these things. And so he had a great, great... Um, goal here. So he had a goal, he had a plan, he had organization to organize the workers, he motivated them, he pressed forward. All of these are, are great um, models here that we see. And all we can say is, you know, leaders, uh, you got to um, incorporate encouragement. You can't be negative downer. And the reality is, again, he wasn't some great spiritual leader per se when he first started. He was a cupbearer of, of Persia, and then look, look what he, and look what God accomplished through him. And so you might say, well, I'm not really a leader per se. You might, maybe you're a leader at work. Maybe you're a leader in some area of ministry. Maybe you're a leader. Um, Maybe you're just a leader at your household. Maybe you're, maybe you're a leader in your family. Like, or 
whatever it might be, I don't know. Um, but the key in reality is, if you want to be this, any, any kind of great leadership, you got to have this thing of encouragement, of up, uplifting and building. You can't be negative, grumbling, whining, complaining, causing troubles, um, uh, criticizing, all of that stuff. That's not going to work. Uh, and it's not going to be a pleasant experience for you or anybody around you, for sure. And so I just say, I, I just say that, right? Because um, we see that Nehemiah constantly said what? We are doing a great work. I am doing a great work, he would say. And we'll more on that here later on. Because um, he did see the importance of what he was doing uh, for, for God. Um, number six, real quick, is we see that uh, be faithful and determine not to allow obstacles to stop your work, you know? Uh, each time, the enemies bullied them, right? They, they met opposition. They met bullies. They met people that wanted to attack them and to disrupt the plans. Uh, Nehemiah did not let that stop him, right? Uh, and so it's very much similar. I say, whenever you're doing anything in life, you're going to most likely face some kind of opposition, some kind of challenge. You might have naysayers, you might have critics, you might have people trying to sabotage you, uh, and that sadly even happens in the church, and you, but you do not let that stop, right, what God is calling you to do. You press forward, you move forward, and you don't let it stop what God is calling you to do. It's so key that we see that, right? So, for example, um, we see the enemies had all kind of tactics they tried. Nehemiah stood firm. Go to verse 7, says this, but when Sanballat, Tobiah, uh, uh, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Uh, <laughs> And so the other, play, other areas around them didn't want them rebuilding this wall, right? Uh, because in that, in that time, when you had good walls, that meant good security, you know? The, uh, also, for, for the God's people, it was a sign that God was still with them and God was still fulfilling His promise to be with them. Uh, and so the air, other places around them like, no, we don't need to see all this happen and we need to stop this wall. And they had all kind of tactics and plans to, to do that. Do I have a list of some trials up there? Did I put that up there or know some trials they faced? Uh, yeah, so we see they were ridiculed and bullied, you know. Uh, they, they threatened to attack, so the people prayed and set up guards. That's how they responded. Uh, the enemies, they, they tried to make Nehemiah compromise by drawing him outside the city where they could harm him, and they tried to lure him to meet this temple, um, but, he, uh, but he wouldn't do it to compromise his faith. And they tried to, then that didn't work. They tried to slander and shame Nehemiah with the report they would send to the king. Like, look at all these tactics they tried to disrupt the plan. Uh, and every time, you know, no, no, we weren't having it. We're not going to let these people, the naysayers, the one who are opposing God's work, get their way, you know? Uh, and that's a key thing that we see that's, that's so, so uh, crucial. You know? And so and similarly, um, are you feeling ridiculed or bullied? Uh, that may be the sign that you're doing something. You know, you, if you look, so many people that do great things, um, they will face ridicule. They will face... Um, People bullying them, attacking them. You know, like there's an old saying that goes. Um, I think I actually who, who told me? I don't remember who told me. But the old saying goes that that uh, uh, dogs don't bark at parked cars. You know what I mean? If you're just sitting there, not doing nothing, just. Eh. But if when you start moving in a direction and going somewhere, be prepared. People might gonna criticize you and naysay you and tell you all the reasons why it's dumb and you can't and you shouldn't. You know and. You just got to keep pressing forward, right? That's a sign that you're moving in the right in, in, in a direction. Um, and you're going to hear all kinds of people trying to do the naysaying and the criticizing. And, and just you just keep your um, mind focused on what God is calling you to do or your plan or your goal in alliance with God. And you move forward in that, right? And then they, they, they interesting too, they, they threaten to attack. That's what they do. They prayed and they set up guards. I love this because um, it, it shows a couple things. First of all, they're praying important, right? And they rely on God, but they also set up guards. Hmm, that's interesting. What does that mean? I think that shows that prayer and smart decisions can go hand in hand, right? They could just say, oh, we're just going to pray, God protect us, and then not do anything. And then, but no, they prayed, and they set up guard, a practical smart decision, right? So many people are like, oh, we're just going to trust God, but they don't make smart decisions, 
I think this is a great example that, you know what, no, our decisions also do matter, right? We're working in conjunction with God. We have free will. And so um, it, they, I just don't get it because there's so many people that, that have this kind of just, um, they use it as a religious platitude and then they use it as an excuse to make dumb decisions, right? Like, no, they can go, you can do both, right? Uh, that'd be like saying, well, you know, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to, eat a plate of bacon every day and drink a bottle of whiskey every day and smoke a carton of cigarettes every day and never exercise. And, but I'm just going to trust God that he's going to make things cool with me. Okay. It's like, well, your decisions do matter as well. You know what I mean? Or, and so I think that it's, it's smart that, you, yeah, you pray, but also make smart decisions, you know? And, but some people are very um, uh, arbitrary in this, you know, you, people use it for their advantage, and, and you know, there's even like back when the f- pandemic first came out, you know, it was like, Let's just trust God, and therefore you don't gotta take any precautions or anything like that. And I'm not gonna get political on it because, but the reality is, you can still make smart decisions and trust God, you know, um, because these same people th- that would say that, you know, they would be very same people that they would never go anywhere without wearing a seatbelt. Well. <laughs> okay, if you just trust God, why are you wearing a seatbelt, right? Or they lock their doors at night. If you trust God, why even lock your doors at night? Just trust God. But no, you can trust God. You can pray and still make smart decisions. This is a great example. They did that. They prayed. They trusted God. But they're also setting the guard up out there, right? They're also making some wise decisions here because God gave us a functioning brain. Um, nevertheless, uh, that's just a great topic in general. But this is a perfect example of them um, exhibiting that. They, 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 otherwise, you're going to have to explain why in the world they set up a guard. Why would they do that? Because they knew actually um, there's a smart way of making practical smart decisions as well, as well as trusting God. They can go hand in hand. Um, nevertheless. Um, third thing as you see here with the they're trying to draw him outside and compromise his faith. And he's like, what the, what the way, way he responded is what? He, he, he wouldn't come down. He said, I am doing a great work I cannot come down, right? He saw the importance of what he was doing. He saw the impact of what he was doing. He was not going to let them distract him and pull him away. One thing comes to mind is actually what Paul says, right? What does Paul say? He says, um, do not come, become entangled with civilian affairs, right? Um, or meaning like the, uh, the, the army or whatever. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But basically is you don't get distracted by the um, civilian affairs when you're in town. You keep your eyes and ears fixated on your commander, right? And that's what Paul is talking about in the New Testament. And so, uh, very similarly, he's like, you know what? No, no, I'm not going to get distracted and pull you in there. They wanted to get him in the temple, but he was not worthy. He wasn't the priest, he said, so he wasn't going to do that and compromise. Uh, and so he kept his eyes fixed on the commanding officer and what God was calling him to do. And then when that all didn't, know how, when none of that stuff worked, what his enemies try to do? They tried to slander him and shame him. Um, and he, did, he still didn't get it happen, right? Uh, and that happens sometimes. And sadly, that even happens sometimes in the church where someone tries to maybe slander uh, somebody or shame them into doing something. It's like, no, no, that ain't going to work. That might have worked 10, 20, 30 years ago, maybe, but that ain't going to work. Um, it's just, and that's the mindset people's got to have, right? That I'm focusing on what God is calling you to do and I'm pressing forward. Uh, and so next time the enemies come against you uh, and, and what God is calling you to do and, and coming against a vision or something God has put in your heart, these are great principles to remember and to not give up, to not stop, to be wise and smart in how you, you handle that for sure. Um, because Nehemiah overcame all the opposition and a wall that laid in ruins for 70 years, he had rebuilt in 52 days. That's pretty impressive, you know? A wall that symbolized a great destruction that happened, that was crumbled, that caused him to weep, laid in ruins for 70 years. That thing was up and built in 52 days. Amazing testament to what God can and will do through his people if you are faithful and press forward in that, right? And so again, um, if you face obstacles and challenges, you just press forward. Don't let the naysayers pull you down. Um, have in your mind what Nehemiah had. I cannot come down. I am doing a great work. You know, that's a great mindset to have. What is God calling you to do for, your, for his kingdom um, and in your life? Uh, have that question in your mind. Number seven, real quick, got to live a life of integrity. You know, uh, Nehemiah lived a, a great life of integrity here. Um, he worked humbly and quietly as the cup 
cupbearer for the king of Persia, you know, and then that job, you got to be willing to die because he's testing, you know, the cup of the king for poison if someone's trying to poison the king. No, it doesn't sound like a fantastic job to me, but, uh, you know, whatever, I guess. And um, uh, he, he shows humility and smarts and how he responds to the king when he's uh, going forth his request. Uh, he always sought to obey God. That was a big, big thing here for Nehemiah. He always wanted to honor God and everything that he did. Um, do we have that kind of mindset in our lives where I just want to honor God? You know? um, also, Nehemiah kept his promise to the king to return, and then he returned back to Jerusalem, right? And so he kept his promise when he, he said he was gonna, he, what he was going to do, he did. Uh, that's an important thing that we see here that he, he had. Um, uh, when he discovered that some of the, the leaders had an evil enemy, um, they had a room in the courts, he, he threw them out and restored the workers of the house of God. Um, he also stopped people from working on the Sabbath and commanded them to turn back to God, right? That's, a, that's an important thing that he did here. He told them to purify themselves and to, to um, do their duties, um, uh, purifying God's people according to his laws. Uh, and I just say this is, you know, he, he, he uh, paid attention to his actions and he strived to please God. That's an important thing. One of the very first things you see in his prayer is he's, you know, seeing the need of God's people to um, repent and turn back to God. You know, that's the thing. He recognized that. And so in our lives, too, you know, we got to live a life of integrity. Uh, and it can, I know none of us are perfect. We all struggle and sin and make mistakes. Let's be honest and real about that. But we don't want to make it the norm, you know. Uh, in our daily life, day by day, do you strive to um, do these basic things of, I just want to honor God. I want to um, keep my promises. I want to um, just be a person of integrity, right? Uh, and that's an important thing that we see Nehemiah exhibit for sure. Uh, and, and when we do that, you know, that's, see what happens um, when you're connected with God with that. Number eight, we see also is have a heart of, of love for the people to be fully restored. Um, kind of, uh, that's a key thing that we see, right? Restored hearts and relationships back to God. That's one of the things that we see is Nehemiah's heart was to see God's people turn back to God, right? He wanted God's people to be restored. He wanted God to um, restore the nation of, of Israel and to, to, to fulfill his promise. And so Nehemiah's heart was always for God and always a desire to see God's people turn back to him. And so as Christians, do we have a desire to see people turn to God? You know, so I, I think we forget this sometimes. We, so many Christians, we just see maybe non-Christians or people that disagree with us or whatever, we see them as the enemy, right? And, and some, some Christians, you know, like, oh, they're going to get what they deserve, you know, and kind of just like almost taking pleasure in that almost. And it's like, well, should you not want to see people turn to God? You know what I mean? And so the joy that happens when somebody that um, doesn't know God or maybe is um, rebelling against God, when they actually see that God um, is a God who, is, who loves them, who, who died for them, who, who wants to be in a relationship with them, and when they turn from darkness to light, like, should we want to see rejoicing in that, right? A people that were heading towards destruction and, and in bondage and chains of the evil one and going through life just in darkness and, and all of this, that now they actually see the truth and see the light and see hope and see love and experience God's love and mercy and grace when they were walking through life in a dark, um, just um, hopeless state, you know? And so it's a mind shift change, I think, for us Christians is, we, we want to see people come to God, you know, and that should be it. Like, you see people not just, so many times people as Christians, we just see like maybe their behaviors, right? Like, look what they're doing, look how they're acting, look what they're saying. But we don't see past that to see someone that God would desperately and, and does desperately want to turn to him, right? Um, and I think Jesus models it so best is Jesus, when he sees the woman caught in adultery, he doesn't baptize the behavior. He doesn't say, oh, it's okay, no. He, he sees the woman, offers mercy, grace, and forgiveness, um, hope, and then he does tell the woman, say, well, get up and now sin no more, right? So and when he dines with the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes and all of that, he's not 
um, saying their behaviors are okay, but he's seeing people who desperately need to turn to God, right? That's why he says what? It's not the healthy need a doctor, it's the sick, right? Come not to call the righteous, but the unrighteous. And so having a heart that we want to see people restored back to God. We want to see people saved. We want to see people finding the purpose and love um, for their life that can be only found in their creator. And so it's a mind shift change, you know, for sure. Um, and, and we also see, again, um, Nehemiah's heart for when he sees people that got, got people that weren't doing that, right? When he sees the Israelites and got people that have um, rebelled and turned from him, he recognizes that and says, you know what, you got to get right with God. And so very much similarly, if you're a Christian, um, if you personally or no others have, have turned uh, and are not living and walking with God, you should have a desire to want to see that, you know, um, and, and move towards that. And so I just say that we, we, it's a key component here. We can learn valuable lessons, right, to restoring and maintaining a relationship with God as the people return, rebuild the city. And, um, but again, the first order of business for, for Nehemiah is to make sure that uh, God's people remember the law of Moses and the covenant and all of that. You know, that's, that's the first order of business he made for sure with that. Now, number nine, we're almost done. Number nine is uh, lead people to God. You know, it's, it's pretty simple, but... Um, Nehemiah's uh, overall focus on God and goals moving towards, you know, and the Christians. Do you have any desire to lead people to God? Uh, not just to get a pat on the back or not just to look righteous or self-righteous or not just to get yourself to heaven, right? Do you have any desire to lead people to God? Uh, go to, um, you know, the people wept when they listened when Nehemiah told them all of this. But then look how Nehemiah replied uh, in verse 10. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, as this leader, Nehemiah looked out for the welfare of his people, right? Not just the condition of the city. And he, he... when he, when he rebuked them for their sinful ways and for the evil that, that has been going on, they wept and they realized just how far they've gotten away from God. But then what happened? He said, okay, let's not stay weeping in, in this state. Now that you recognize the problem, now there is repentance. And, and, and now he says, okay, um, let's go. Choice food, drinks, and um, this is the day the Lord says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, right? So you can rejoice in the Lord. There's time for weeping and repentance, but don't stay just always beating yourself up and, and negative and, and um, uh, in that state of time. Okay, now, forgiven, redeemed, restored, let's move forward and rejoice in the joy of the Lord, as he would say, right? And should share our faith and encourage our family members to be faithful to God. Um, number 10, be fully focused on God. Uh, is this even a priority in our lives? You know, we're so busy so many times and so many avenues, but this is, should be the core of all that we really do. You know, um, that's why it says, "What uh, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness; all these other things will be given unto you." Uh, and for Nehemiah, he always just wanted to honor God, to please God, to fulfill God's plan and purpose and destiny. Um, and we see that all through the examples with the way he lived his life, the way he um, oriented things, the way he went through his planning. You know, he, his, his prayer life even reflected someone who fully trusted God, who fully um, desired God's will to be done. You know, we pray that prayer in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you know. But so many times, do you really want God's will to be done or do you want your will to be done? Uh, and that's something that you have to think about. But for Nehemiah, he... he um, always had fully focused on God in every area of your life. And that's just, I, I think it goes back to you know, all those different areas of our life to say, is Jesus Lord of this area of my life? You know, um, Everyone wants a Savior, but many people don't want a Lord. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, and that's a, big, that's, that's a difference there a little bit, right? I want a Savior, take, take me to heaven, but I don't want to actually submit all my areas of my life over to God. And again, that's just something we can simply spend some time in prayer and say, you know, are there any areas in my life that I have not submitted over to God? Uh, and that can be so many. It could be 
my, the way I think, the way I talk, the way I spend my finances, the way I treat my spouse, the way I handle my marriage, the way I act around my friends, the way I do things at work, the way I, um, the actions that I do uh, or don't do, the way I view people, like the, the, there's so many components and areas that make up different areas of our life and you don't got to get too crazy theological in it. You can just say, am I honoring God? Is the goal to honor God in all these areas of my life? And maybe the answer is, you know, yes in some of them, uh, but no in other areas. Um, and maybe the answer is no in any of them. I don't know. You, only you know that. Only God can reveal that to you if you pray and, ask, pray and ask Him that. But just be fully focused on God and what He's calling you to do. And have in the mind, you know, cannot come down. I am doing a, a, a great work. And even though you might not realize you're doing a great work, you just, just realize that, that God has put you in charge of whatever little corner He has put you in. You know, like God has trust your family. That's what you were stewarding. All right? So... How are you taking care of that? How are you ministering to that? Um, your, your place of work or business, okay, that's your little corner that you can have influence or your mission field, if you will. Um, how are you, you know, engaging in that? Um, uh, people you encounter just randomly, you know. Um, could it be a God appointment, some of these people? You know, but you will never even think about it if your antenna is not up and asking those questions. Um, but again, uh, these are things to think about. We all can struggle and be in challenges, but we'll do better if we realize this. And again, the real question is, it's, it's just about building life of faith, right? Um, and the question this morning is, what are you building? Everyone's building something. Uh, what are you building? And we can see the, the, the principles Nehemiah applied in his life to build a life of faith. Um, because everyone is building something for something. The question is, what is that? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and everybody here. God, forgive us all times that we have not been faithful. Lord, we know, we, we just humbly come before you and recognize we need your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness. God, we see Nehemiah's story is just an example of faithfulness and persistence, perseverance. And even though he lived far away from his home, he never gave up hope that someday he would return to it. And even though he was, most of his life, in a pagan land in exile, he, he always kept the faith in you, trusting in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though he was in a pagan land. And God, we see the key of prayer in his life, always coming before you in prayer, always interceding on behalf of his people, wanting his people to turn to you and wanting you to, to fulfill what you've promised to do, God. And we see that he was blessed for his perseverance. And God, Nehemiah had such care for his people that he never gave up hope of the restoration, not only to the homeland, but to you, the God who called them and their forefathers, Abraham, out of the same area and made a, a covenant with him one that Nehemiah believed would stand forever, Father. And even in the face of challenges and oppositions and, and naysayers and whatever it might be, Nehemiah re recognized what you put in his heart, had a goal, a vision, a plan for going about that, lived life in integrity, did not allow naysayers and obstacles to pull him down because he realized and focused on you and bringing people to, back to you to accomplish your purpose. God, let us have these principles and apply these principles to our own lives. We go out of these doors and realize the story continues of what you want to do and are doing through your people. How will we respond? Guide us and lead us in Christ's name to help build us a life of, help us build a life of faith through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.